Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Uh, Okay, hopefully that's sharing properly now. All right, let's try that again. Uh, Shabbat Shalom, everyone, wherever you may be in the world. And uh, it's wonderful to have you all here live. And uh, for those who are just joining us via video, um, we gather here in River Shabbat uh, every Saturday at 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. So whatever that equates for you, um, if you want to come and join us, just go to rivershabbat.com and scroll down on that home screen and you'll see welcome to the river. And all you got to do is hit that subscribe button and you put in your first and last name and your email address and that will put you on the community uh, newsletter list and we will send out that news. We send that newsletter out every week, which contains the live Zoom link uh, for the gathering. So if you haven't come and joined us live, uh, come and join us live. We'd love to see you. Okay, so we're continuing here in Thy Will Be Done. And uh, th the premise of looking at this Thy Will Be Done, and it's kind of a, you know, uh, dual meaning, uh, Thy Will Be Done. And it really is down to whether, as we've gone through the first two parts of the series, um, as to which way this can go, depending on what's happening uh, in our uh in the mind and uh whether it's his will or our will so we're looking at this we looked at part one under authority we looked at part two under position last week and we're looking at requests our prayer lives uh today as we look at part three of this so i've got a quote here our prayer requests and i've got here this is uh this is one of my quotes here don't pray that it will always go well for you pray it will go right for you in his eyes and one of the things that, uh, um, and in fact, I just went through this this week with with a brother um, requesting prayer. And it's one of these things. Sometimes we find ourselves in a place where uh, we need his guidance. We need his wisdom. We need uh, his understanding uh, to make certain choices and decisions and things like that. Um, but often in our prayers, uh, we can sometimes just want it all to uh, go well according to us. Um, but I think as we mature and what the Father is doing, we'll speak about this today, is to get us to a place uh, that it will go right on the path and the choices we're facing, the decisions that we're making in his eyes. And this is why it's so important for uh, our will and in the Greek, the Thelema and uh, the Father's. Uh, will Thelema kind of meet in this sovereign place where uh, he can be with us and uh, we can be a part of experiencing our journey uh, from a different perspective uh, in the sense of um, it's not a wish list that we're living, um, but it is actually a, a direction and knowing that um, he is with us uh, along this journey or this path. And we'll speak about that today. So we're going to look at Thy Will Be Done, part three, prayer requests. Uh, and sort of looking at our prayer lives. And when we mature beyond uh, it being Santa Claus God, we start to then look at, well, what does this mean for our lives? And, and over the course of, um, as we mature in the faith, um, our prayers um, will start to shift from self-based to, um, to uh, what he is wanting, um, uh, praying for others, doing these sorts of things. It won't be consumed with just our own personal circumstances and situations, although we are to make our requests be known. But in what position are we doing that? And so we we went through that last week and to sort of look now if we can, uh, if we understand the true authority we're going to, and if we're coming in a position that is pleasing to him, then our prayer requests fall into a different place. So we looked at this, why repentance? And in 2 Peter 3, 8, 9 last week, the uh, Bolumai or Bolumai, um, it says this here, but do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that the master is one day is a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. So this reference to his great plan of redemption, the 7,000 year plan of redemption, 
um, this allotment of what we would call time or in the time domain. So we've been inserted into something. And it goes on to say this in Second Peter, the master is not slow to fulfill his promise, his some count slowness. So we are experiencing this all from the time domain perspective. He is not. He is outside. Time is a physical property. So we've been inserted into this test uh, for a short moment as a part of this great plan of redemption. And for all of us here today, this is our moment in it. And so we are experiencing this thing called life. Um, but patient towards you. So he has a patience towards us while we're experiencing the test, while we're experiencing the time domain. This is not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach shuv or repentance, metanoia in the Greek, repentance in the English, this whole thing here. What is the, the context of this? He's wanting us to get to a place, this bulimai, um, to have purpose, to be minded, this desire that he has for us to reach a certain position so we spoke about that last week in greater deal and we looked at sort of you know repent in the english and metanoia in the greek which sort of gets a bit more of the flavor of this changing one's mind but the real and the hebrew uh, in the greek in uh in hebrew the nacham in it really relates to how most of us in the english understand repent and that is to be sorrowful or remorseful but in reality, what true shuv is, um, and to be in a place of teshuva, to be in this place of repentance, is that we're actually turning back to the Father and His ways, His righteousness, and to understand that. And so as a part of the journey, it's not just feeling bad for all our bad behavior in the flesh and all this kind of thing that we get with this Western connotation. And so we spoke about that. We don't want to be in the uh, sorrowful place and then that's it. You know, we want to really get to a place where we're, we are turned to Him and His ways, essentially turned to the tree of life. Uh, so that we can come to him in our requests, in our prayer lives, in, in the right position. So we looked at under the rod and those who are being chosen, who are being marked. Um, and he's making us pass in this time domain under his staff, under his uh, 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 Shavet is the word being used here in Ezekiel 20, 34 to 37. And so we looked at this because the, it's about coming into the bond of the covenant. And so he is marking us that which is fit for sacrifice. And so this is an interesting thing that we are being, being marked, being chosen um, to face you know, this to be in this wilderness in this test of life that um, that will enter, he'll enter into judgment with us, panim, panim. And so, face to face. So, this journey starts to denote an intimacy as it relates to the scepter and being chosen as a part of the faith and being called into this. And so, this is going to. Uh, sort of um, bring into our lives certain aspects. And we talked about that last week with the crushing. So the different ways that um, generally defined um, or um, translated as rod in scripture, you will see these four main uh, uh, Hebraic words with the Shabbat, the Mishnah, the Matah, and the Machal all being used, but they have slightly different connotations as they are being used. And so we want to understand his anointed authority, uh, the way that it's truly expressed in, in ancient Hebraic terms, not just the way we think of, you know, rod in the English, because generally rod has a connotation, doesn't it, of generally being associated with just punishment. And so we misread certain things, um, you know, like this whole spare the rod, spoil the child. That's actually what it's saying in the Hebrew is spare the, the proper authority over a child's life. And it will, if you, if you spare that proper authority, it will spoil. And of course we are seeing this on a mass scale as the world has entered into a self-will uh, operation. We're all going to become our, you know, embrace being our own God and do things our way. What we are seeing is this uh, lack in this whole measure of um, authority is becoming a crisis on earth. And I've done uh, teachings on authority crisis and things like that, which goes into this in a bit more depth. But actually, if we're to understand it the way he wants, he's a, it's about bringing his loving authority and establishing that over that which is marked. 
Um, and so it's like the, the master is taking his, his staff, um, uh, and and bringing us into a place where we can experience um, coming into this place of repentance or shuv. And so we spoke about that a lot last week. And one of the key scriptures here I'm going to say in Numbers uh, in 1279 says this, and this was referring to Moshe. And there was a particular incident happening with Miriam and Aaron, and they were kind of declaring, well, you know, we, we hear from God too, you know, and all this kind of thing. And what they didn't realize was the position that Moshe had reached through coming out of being second in command in, in uh, the kingdom of Egypt, which was basically akin to a demi God and to be humbled to the level that he was and to spend 40 years in the wilderness being broken and being positioned for the great service that he was going to do, which we read about that would um, uh, be chosen as a part of uh, Elohim working with his house of Israel. And we see all this go down, but um, Miriam and Aaron had a, had a moment where they forgot this. And so one of the things it says here in Numbers 12, 7, 9, not so with my servant Moshe. So he's addressing them. Don't think that your position before me is at the level that Moshe's is at. And he says, he is faithful in all my house. So there's a, there's a, there's a place here where Elohim is going, hey, listen, you're on your journey, but don't think that you've reached the level of position that Moshe has. And we spoke about that in detail last week. With him, I speak mouth to mouth, or padel. Um, literally, he is able to deal with my voice uh, clearly and not in riddles. And he beholds the form of Yah. So he's able to hear and to see uh, at a level and in a way that Miriam and Aaron at this point just couldn't. He says, why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moshe? He's making the point. You're willing to do this, thinking you're something you're not. And, he, and basically, essentially, Elohim is reminding them, you're not where Moshe is. And this is very, very important. We often think of ourselves, we gain a little bit of knowledge or we do all these sorts of things or we think we're so wonderful. And then suddenly, you know, we're in this position and we're seeing this all over the body. Unfortunately, you know, wow, you know, I don't answer to this or I don't listen to anyone else. I do my own thing. And yet in Yah's eyes, this is not good because you've got this position where we're of, of Moshe before Elohim of Perdel uh, and uh, the Temanah. He's getting to the point where he can literally communicate with Yah at a way they just haven't reached. And so um, there was some consequences to all that, which we spoke about last week. But really, it sits under this whole thing of um, my kingdom. And there's me sitting on my throne. And I've got this thing there where I'm going, you know, is, is all authority that I'm experiencing in the time domain really in my control. And so if I ends up happening that I really believe that and start to live in that place, it can really affect my position as it did with this example with Miriam and, and Aaron at the time where you're dealing with two places where you will go, uh, sitting on the throne of your own life. And this is often to a self-righteous place. And then we enter into judgment of others, uh, or we can go into self-condemnation and we can judge and sit in a place of judging uh, ourselves. Neither is the right position, neither is healthy and neither will be good fruit. And so when we're looking at this last week in position, this can now start to affect our prayer life, our request. Because if I'm defining my heart's desire, my needs, then I'm essentially, and I'm sitting on the throne of my life, I'm going to start bringing that actually into my prayer life, into requests. And so this is, you know, I've got the statement here, the fallen throne of self, getting off the throne of self will lead to his shalom. These are the things that bring shalom into our life because we're not essentially trying to be Elohim over our lives. We're surrendering that. Um, one of the greatest things that brings anxiety and confusion and the loss of shalom into people's lives is they're actually sitting on the throne of their lives. They are not actually in shuv turned to the throne. And so we live these lives of faith 
constantly not in this turmoil and not in a place of shalom. Yet if we, if our position changes, what will come with that is shalom. And this is, this is very, very important, I believe, as it comes into our prayer lives. And so I've got here the unrighteous judge. Well, we want the righteous judge over our lives, and that's who we want to be turned to, not the unrighteous judge, which is us. And so we have this battle going on. But we see here, and the example I gave last week was of the two witnesses, an incredible example where they have reached such a level with Elohim, that they are actually going to be entrusted with the actual power of the throne. Um, You know, we saw that example with Moshe, he was entrusted with the staff, he was entrusted with, you know, what was going on and leading people out of the bondage in Egypt. These these, uh, great examples of people that have reached a place of humility. And now what's interesting is that we think of humility as somebody is being nice and softly spoken. Um, I think that if we could spend time with Moshe or even with Yeshua and many of the disciples and many of the great prophets of scripture, if you're actually honest with what you're reading, it wouldn't meet a modern definition of what we think humble is. And in fact, we would accuse Moshe and even Messiah himself that he was not humble. And that would indeed be incorrect because humility is not about speaking just softly or being nice or telling other people what they want to hear. That is not the definition of it. It is a true position before Elohim. And often we see with the uh, with Messiah and, and many of the great servants that we see recorded in scripture, um, sometimes what they said and what they did didn't seem so nice, didn't sound so nice. And so we got to be very, very careful that we don't confuse uh, this position um, because those who are entrusted with representing Elohim, uh, as with the example of these two witnesses, they were in a place uh, and the typology that's given is they're clothed in sackcloth. They are in an absolute position of shuv and they're being trusted with the power of the throne and to such a degree that they're wielding it as they will. And this is very, very important because, you know, what would the prayer life look like of the two witnesses if they're entrusted literally with the power of the throne? Can we be trusted? We look at ourselves right now and everybody goes, oh yeah, give me the power of the throne. Yeah. And I'll do really great things with it. Are we really in a place to be trusted with such power? Could we be? You know, I know at times in my life and in my faith journey, my walk, that if I was entrusted with that level, as described in Revelation concerning the two witnesses, with what Moshe was entrusted with, what Messiah was entrusted with, with indeed the uh, disciples uh, and the apostles of the early Kahal, what would I have done with that? And if I could have wielded at certain stages of my spiritual journey, might I even hurt people with the very requests I was making? You see, this is this is something I believe the example, especially with with, uh, what we see with some of these accounts, with these great servants that are recorded in Scripture, is that they're being entrusted with something that if it's not wielded, wielded in love, in humility, people are going to get hurt and they're going to get hurt. And and if you're suddenly giving and entrusting that to somebody who's in a self-righteous position or a self-condemning position, This would not be wise of the father to entrust that with that level of spiritual maturity. So I've got here this question. So isn't this just all about sin in my life, Curtis? You know, many of you may be in your spiritual journeys, you know, oh, well, the father's not answering your prayer because of your bad behavior. This is how simple we take it down to. You know, well, you have sin in your life and sin is being determined by bad behavior in the flesh. It's not being determined as defined by scripture that actually sin is missing the mark of his righteousness. We indeed have been put into a position of missing the mark. So if if that's the case, you know, and I've got here, you know, the the big questions, and I reference this from time to time in the teachings, you didn't decide to be born. 
Now, there might be some deeper meaning in behind that one as to uh, what role we played in relationship to being inserted in the time domain. But ultimately, Elohim decided this. You didn't. You came into the time domain and you were a little child, a little baby that needed help. You didn't understand anything about anything. And now you've got spiritual amnesia. So you're sitting there in this very, very most vulnerable position that you didn't decide to be in. You certainly didn't decide to be born fallen. Elohim did. So you now didn't decide to be born, and now you don't decide to be born fallen. You're born a sinner. In fact, David went as far as to saying, I was conceived in sin. This is how much he understood this. So you don't decide to come into this time domain, and you don't decide the state you come into this time domain. Did you decide that you will die as a result of that? No. None of us, especially in an immature spiritual state, would go, you know, I'm going to, you know, die as a part of this whole journey. And yet, the only way out of this, to not be trapped in this current fallen state, is going to be physical death. This is the Father's way. He's not determined us to experience this forever. But there is a very good reason for all of it. Do you justify or save anyone? So you didn't decide to be born. You've been born a sinner. You've been born fallen. You're not going to decide you're going to die because of it. And now we're all running around acting like we're saving people. This is getting a little crazy. Do you convict and circumcise anyone's heart? So you can't justify them. You can't circumcise those heart. You don't even have the choice whether you live or die in this current state. You're born fallen and you didn't even decide to be born at all. And what is the point in the meaning of our earthly life? You see, if we actually think of how foolish it is to actually think we sit on the throne of our lives, and we're going to turn to ourself in this self-righteousness or condemning way. This is folly if we actually understand these big questions. This is the things and the matters that are all outside our control. And we talked about this. There is These big questions are outside of our control, but they are in his control. And we need to understand that Elohim, although all these matters might be outside our control and all of these things that are going on, there is a place where he gives us in the time domain where we will have our personal sovereignty, but but a short time. Now, his sovereignty is in play at all levels. He is Elohim. The question is, will my Goddom actually submit and align and become a Chad with the goddam. <laughs> Will I actually do this? Will I actually submit? And this is what, when you saw in the example of Moshe with Miriam and Aram, he's saying, <laughs> Moshe has done this way more than you have, you two. You need to understand that he is more aligned, the sovereignty of man and Elohim is becoming a chad. And so it's going to affect what is actually a part of the sovereignty that he's given us, <clears throat> our boundaries, our thoughts, our actions, the goals, what we desire, what we give our efforts, our servitude, how we speak to ourselves and to others, how I handle all of this. And this in the Greek is basically our self-will, the thalema. And so we spoke about that. But if we know it now in context of our requests in our prayer lives, this is interesting. Will our prayer lives stay the same as our sovereignty, as our thalema aligns and becomes a chad with his? The more we mature in the faith, are your prayers looking or sounding exactly like they did as a 10-year-old, as a 15-year-old, as a 25-year-old? What is actually happening? Is it possible that if we spiritually mature, he will not become Santa Claus God anymore? He will not become the God of self. We will actually start to have our way slowly 
start to turn and become his ways. And if that actually happens, what occurs in the battleground of the mind? And this is what Paul referred to as the renewing of the mind, the renewing where the thalema of self meets the thalema of Elohim. And I'm going to suggest to you in this place that our prayer lives are dramatically affected if it occurs. What we are trusted with and what we bring before the throne is going to change. And it's not all based on just our bad behavior is whether he listens to us or not, whether we're naughty or nice. If that was the case, I'm not sure Elohim would have answered any of my prayers, requests, or listened to me over the course of my life. I'm sure all of you have been very well behaved in the flesh your whole life. And this, and none of this is a problem. And this whole message is for me. But I personally have struggled in my fallen state. My whole life. And yes, the fruit of that has gotten better in the rearview mirror in many ways. And many things have been overcome. But the reality of it is, is if him listening to me and being with me was based purely on my fleshly behavior, I would be in trouble. And there are people that are brought to places of guilt. They're praying for something. And then somebody else comes along in the faith who's probably just as immature as they are. Oh, well, God's not answering you because of the sin in your life. We've all heard this. Maybe some of you haven't, but this actually happens. And so somebody thinks, well, if I just stop doing this bad behavior, then Elohim will give me my heart's desire. Not even thinking for a second that is your heart's desire, is your thalema, because your heart's desire is being determined what's going on up here. What if that's actually not aligned with him? Do we have a loving father, a good father? Or do we have a genie in a bottle? A Santa Claus God. Which one is it? We, we, you can't have both. So is this matter that is spoken about in scripture directly affect our prayer life? And then we looked at the, the stages of our spiritual journey. We understand him. We first come to him chosen and knowing that he is father Elohim. But many of us don't have a good example in the earthly uh, witness of a father. How do we relate to this? So we see him infinitely. Well, he's our savior. He's our Messiah. As I determine him to be. What a mistake that is when we make him in our own image, which has been the problem of Israel all the way through. If we grow a little bit more, then we'll start to see him as that father. We'll start to learn who he is. So as a child grows, you see the physical shadow picture. They start to know mom and dad a bit more. They start to physically. Well, that's occurring spiritually. That whole typology is actually playing out spiritually. The whole thing that Hasatan is doing is working with us sitting on the throne of our lives that we will never grow beyond the child stage. That we will not mature in our faith, in our journey. And if we don't mature in our faith and our journey, then our prayer lives will match that. If we mature and keep growing, if we keep going down the crushing of our lives, if we keep knowing that there is a purpose to the test and albeit temporary, haval, it is going to have real meaning and purpose because love is being accomplished through this sovereign process. As a king and a high priest, we start to see him in a servitude manner. I am a servant of the king and the high priest. This is a, another level above just he saves me or just he's the father that gives me my needs and wants. Suddenly we'll mature to a place where we realize we have a servitude. And then there's a final stage. And I believe this is something as a part of his great plan. He is looking for those who can actually 
sit with him to rule and to reign. And we've seen these examples throughout scripture of those who reach that final position. This is an intimacy level at the highest levels where you're actually entrusted with the authority of the throne to be at that level. That is what you take to the altar. This is the spiritual typology of a bridegroom. He's taking us to a place where we could actually be entrusted, just like a husband and a wife in a proper household, there is an authority that is a chad there. And I often say this with, with Pip, if you speak to my wife on a certain matter and you're asking certain things or understanding that whether it relates to the house or whether it's spiritually or whatever it is, you are speaking to me if we're a chad. She is not going to be in opposition, not in how the house is run, not in spiritual understanding. And it matters because there is an order to the house. And she is completely entrusted with the authority of our house in the shadow picture. If I was incapacitated or sick or couldn't, couldn't get a hold of me, if somebody got a hold of Pip, she will deal with that the way I would. And that's the point to such a degree that I entrust her, our thalema, our wills are aligned in our house enough that she can truly actually experience that place of a chad that relates to an intimate, an intimate journey. And so that's reflected to us in the shadow picture, like a bridegroom. And so this is what he's trying to understand on this journey to know him. And then we've got this adversary picture, one's opponent in contest or conflict or dispute, an adversary, something that is coming against you. Well, you don't want that at the, at the marriage level, do you? Anybody's ever experienced a spouse coming against them or being the adversary, this is not a, play, a nice place to live. If you've experienced your children doing this, it's not a nice thing to experience. You want the children to come to grow, to mature, to stop being in this place of adversary. But we've got this great picture, this Hasatan, who's been established, this office of adversary that's being allowed to test, to tempt, to take us through this journey, to see where we are really at. And will we join the position of adversary against Elohim or will we have the renewing of the nine and come in line with his will? And therefore, no matter what is coming against us, we are not becoming an adversary to Elohim. Because I'm going to suggest to you that even many of our prayers are in opposition to the will of Elohim. And then we're wondering why it's not being answered. His disciples are the adversary. What? There's a moment that Yeshua experiences here. He's being about to be led away, being taken to the ancient Tav. And we know, and we talked about this earlier uh, in the series, of what he was experiencing in his time of crushing. And Yeshua was literally going, nonetheless, Father, thy will, your thalema be done on this situation. He's literally submitting to this greater picture. As a result of all of this, the uh, the high priest guards come in and, and the Sanhedrin, and they're coming in to basically take him, get him to take him away. And then you caught this incident where, uh, where Peter is literally pulling out his sword. And Yeshua says to him, put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. So he's taking his own sword, not the sword of truth and the word. He's going to take his physical sword. And he's going to act according to what was going on in his mind, his thalema, what he had determined should be happening here. And it wasn't what he was witnessing, what he saw. What he saw was his sign to grab his sword. Do you think I cannot appeal to my father? Now think about what Yeshua has just been through. And now he's going to be led to his death unjustly. And he's not missing the mark. Sinless. To win this journey in the life experience without cheating, where he lived a life of being turned and submitting himself. And he's in such a position, he's reminding him now at this point, it's interesting what he does here. 
Yeshua knows. He knows what the position is. I'm not going to go against the will of Elohim, yet he has the literal capacity to do it, and he now points it out to them. So we looked at the incident with Hasatan and the whole turning the bread and uh, turning the stones into bread, you know, saving himself, all these sorts of things. And now he's dealing with an adversarial position from his own disciples. And that adversarial position was his disciples trying to spare his life. How is that being against <laughs> against him? And this is how he points out. He will at once send me more than 12 legions of messengers. Do you still not see? This is not about your Thelema, Peter. This is about Elohim. And you're struggling to see. You're reading the signs wrong because of what's happening around you. And he's making the point. I'm in such a position before the throne. I could call 12 legions of messengers. But then he says, but then how should the scriptures be fulfilled? Well, the scriptures of that time is what we call the Old Testament or the Tanakh. In other words, all the messianic prophecies. And the great plan of redemption. That it must be so. He is defaulting something here from a position of extreme authority. And yet he is not going to act on it. He's going to submit to the will. In other words, trusted. This is my particular uh, Torah portion, actually. This is what was being read out um, by our Jewish brethren uh, in the Torah portions when I was actually born. And uh, it's concerning, uh, funnily enough, Balaam's donkey. Um, I actually started to understand the servitude of the donkey. I go into this in the series long before I actually understood uh, what was actually being read in the word by my Jewish brethren when I was actually physically born. Um, and in some way, I was shocked to, to realize it was Balaam's donkey <laughs> because I was relating to that long before I ever knew this. Um, and yet somehow I wasn't in another way. But the hair stood up on my end when I really realized this about this. So this Torah portion is very um, special to me. But there's something interesting here in this account. It says, but Elohim's anger was kindled because he went. So the, the, this prophet for hire, Balaam, is doing something that he should not be doing. And he's going to take a path. And he's got this servant with him, his donkey. And this messenger of Yah took his stand in the way. So this messenger of Yah, and I believe this you're seeing one of the first Tanakh appearances or one of the early appearances of Yeshua Messiah. And he's standing in the way. Now remember in this account, what is actually happening where you've got the account of the messenger basically ends with warning Balaam that if this donkey hadn't seen what you couldn't, your life would have been required of you because you have missed the mark in my eyes. And make no mistake of what a messenger when it says my eyes. This is an authority speaking that is very, very serious. He's dealing with Messiah. And he's going along this and he says, Yah took. Okay, the messenger of Yah, Yeshua Messiah, took his stand in the way as his adversary. Wait a minute. So you mean Messiah can play and be the adversary in our lives on matters? Isn't just the wily devil? It's not just our own self-will? That Messiah can actually do this and the outcome of this could actually spare our lives. The outcome of this could actually bring good fruit. We get to look at this in the way the word being near used there, the derach. Um, way, road, distance, journey, manner, direction, course of life. Look at this of moral character. The root of this, the derach to bend, to tread, to march forth to tread upon, to press, to crush. 
the archer, this reflection to hitting the mark as a result, to bend with a foot. It's interesting in this account how the donkey smashes his foot against, you know, the, uh, the walls there. Look what it says here. Now he was riding on the donkey and his two servants were with him. So he's with his servants, he's with his donkey, he's riding in there. And Yah's going to take his stand as adversary here. And the donkey saw the angel of Yah standing on the road with a drawn sword in his hand. And the donkey turned aside off the road and went into the field. And Balaam struck the donkey to turn her into the road. So you have an interesting thing. Balaam is not seeing this. He's not understanding this. I'm on this path. I'm doing something that Yah is not happy. And Yah is going to stand directly in his way on this path. And the servant, his animal servant there, the donkey, is going to see what he can't. And his life's going to be spared because of it. And Yah is taking the true adversary position. By the way, in our English Bibles, we see Satan translated all over the place. And it's not always the boogeyman or our Hollywood version of the wily devil. We can play an adversarial position with each other. Yah can play an adversarial position to us. And there is also thy adversary, which has come to test and attempt. Look at this. It goes on to say, Then the angel of Yah stood in a narrow path, this mashol, one of the words here for path in Hebrew, but the particular narrow, a hollow way, a narrow way, a road shut between vineyards. Interesting, the root of this, the shaol, hollow, hollow of hand, hollow of hand, this reference here that's being used, I believe, that points to Messiah. Goes on to say, and when the donkey saw the angel of Yah, she pushed against the wall and pressed Balaam's foot against the wall. Think of what we read earlier, this bending of the foot. So he struck her again. So the donkey's now becoming the adversary to Balaam. And, the, and Yeshua is becoming the adversary to Balaam. So this is interesting. This prophet for hire that's doing the wrong thing. Then the angel of Yah went ahead and stood in a narrow place. The Tazar here. Height, distress, adversary, enemy. He's literally going in the tasarar here then the, to, to bind. To sell, to bind, to narrow, to be in distress, to make narrow, cause distress, besiege, to straighten, to bind up, to shut up. Has anybody here ever needed to be shut up at times? <laughs> to cause distress. To press hard, to crush, to vex, harass. Do you know that we can be in such a place where we have lost the battleground of our mind? We need this renewing. And, and because we haven't experienced it, we are exercising our own will, our self-will of Thalema. And we actually are required to receive an adversarial position in order that this may be addressed prevented, preserved. And it's saying here that this is going to be done with pressing and crushing. Do you mean that when we're, our prayers, our requests, if they're not aligned to him, that his av an adversarial position may be required? Not only are our prayers not going to get answered, we need to actually see the folly of them. Fascinating. So an adversarial position is actually going to be used against us in all these various different manners. And it could possibly be because we need it in order to see our folly. Could this actually affect our prayer lives? So what about my prayers and requests? If the father can actually present himself as an adversary, could use each other as an adversary, could do these sorts of things, is it a matter of going, well, the father's not answering my prayers. He doesn't want, is there something here that he may really want us to know as a part of the pressing and the crushing? 
And if we ignore this, if we lose, if we entertain our self thalema and not in line with his thalema, then what is with our prayers? What are we actually presenting to him? Is it in line with his will? Well, I have a sovereign life. I have paths and journeys of my life to choose on. How does this work? Let's keep looking. In Matthew 6, 5, before, how shall we pray, Master? There's something very interesting said here by Messiah. He says, and when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues or the gatherings the synagogue, the coming together, and at the street corners, that they may be seen. They may be seen in the English is actually the Greek word, the final, to bring forth, to cause, to shed this light, to be evident, to come into view, appear, to be exposed so one can be seen with the eye, to be made manifest, to appear. This is interesting. You are doing this so that you may be seen. Hmm. What is going on here? Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. I'm going to talk about signs here, you know, what we often look for. And you often hear this, people, you know, well, I just need a sign from God. Just give me a sign. The definition of sign in the Greek, where this is relating to um, a sign or a miracle or intervention, the main word used in the Greek is the semio, the signal, this token, but also be person or thing distinguished and is known. Even progeny, occurrence, transcending the common course of nature can be miracles, wonders to signify, to indicate, to make known something. Well, as far as signs come from Elohim, this can be something that he actually does. But at what state does he do it? Just hold on to that thought. The definition or the equivalent of this sign in Hebrew is often used as oath. Signal, distinguishing, mark, banner, resemblance, miracle, miraculous, omen, warning, even token, proof, agree, consent. Let's read this here. Matthew 16, 2, 4. He answered them, when it is evening, you say it will be fair weather for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be stormy today for the sky is red and threatening. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. These things that are clearly visible, these things that are miraculous. Look at this, though. An evil and adulterous generation. So one that is not turned to the tree of life, they are turned to self and they are spiritually adulterous as a result, seek for a sign. They want the sign from God, and they want that sign to meet their current adulterous position spiritually. And what they want and what they think it should be in the battleground of their own mind. It says, but no sign will be given except the sign of Jonah. And this, again, we talked about this relating, of course, what that was, was repentance. Shuv. I know many people, they sometimes operate in their lives with this thing. These, uh, they almost operate with this, you know. Uh, traffic light system. Well, if I get this confirmation from God as I will it to be, and I look for it and I see it, and if I see it, then that's a green light in my life. And they look for the green lights of their lives, just as a way of analogy here. And I've got the traffic light there and it's on green. So that means I go because this is my sign that says I do it. And it's like we're, we're driving around looking for what we have determined to be of Elohim. 
not thinking for a second that our position could be very immature or wrong standing before him. And if that's the case, then we are looking for what we have determined we should see to be made visible. They're not miraculous signs from Yah. Often in a childlike state, when we don't spiritually grow, if we're, if we're kept in that child maturity spiritually, we believe what we see. And so if I can see, and you often hear people say this, if I could see, I would believe. And yet Messiah and what Elohim's doing in our life is wanting to get us to a place to believe. And we'll speak about this more next week. And you will see this essence of where faith is now going to meet our prayer requests. And that's the final part of this series. We want the easy answer as children. We want it presented to us on a plate. I just need to know. God told me so. Just give me these little signs. Is this really a spiritually mature place where we require signs in order to be obedient? Is that a place that you would entrust the authority of the throne to? The signs of Elohim, I'm going to suggest to you when the house of Israel was delivered out of bondage out of Egypt and was brought into the wilderness and, and, the, and the house of Israel is going to be established with the 12 tribes. There were things, miraculous signs being seen by them from the pillars of smoke to the plagues to literally his voice on the mountain. And they were so spiritually immature and did not understand their Elohim, did not understand the faith that they begged Moshe to go speak with this God. They couldn't handle seeing him in form and the padea, the mouth to mouth. They actually couldn't receive it. Now, you understand, many of you parents, that your children can be in a state where they cannot receive what you're saying to them. Okay, <laughs> they either don't agree, don't understand, they're scared, whatever else it is, um, or they just disagree, whatever the place may be, they cannot receive the padeh from their parents. They're in a childlike state. You're seeing this in the wilderness. So he's allowing the signs to be seen so that the children can know this is Elohim. But is that the position he wants them to finish in? That it's just got to be... All of these signs. Is this a position that any parent would want with their own children? Oh, I don't believe you, mom and dad, unless you show me. No, I'm not going to do it unless you show me. No, I got to see it. I got to see it. Now, if you were speaking to your 20-year-old child, not your five-year-old child, and they were talking to you the same way, I think you would find this, at very least, irritating. You don't want that. You don't want them making their requests and looking and listening to what you're saying in the same way they received that as a little child. There was a need for them at one point in their life to see you as mom and dad. Little children often think that they're, you know, um, you know, their dads can be a superhero. You know, they can do anything or mom's a superhero. They just do everything and they make everything, you know, and then as they get older, you know, they start to grow up and realize certain things, but they, they literally need to see something. But the voices and the language is given in, in Sinai here. And this incredible layout of the, of the tents and the 12 tribes and it forming this ancient Tav on the, on the, on the, on the, on the, uh, on the ground, at the base of Sinai. You've got this literal voice. This wilderness experience of fire, smoke, voice of thunder. We actually get the Greek word for fire, which is like lightning, fiery fire, literally, figuratively speaking, of lightning. It's where we get pyrotechnics from. What are pyrotechnics? When you watch the fireworks, we all, who's gone out to see the fireworks? And you go out and you see them exploding in the air and doing all these sorts of things. We're going out to see something visibly happening. This is what he was doing while they were in a very, very immature state. They were going to have to learn and grow. We see this narrow gate here in Matthew 7, 1, 13. It says, enter in by that narrow gate, narrow straight, the stenos. This straight way for the gate is wide. 
And the way is easy that leads to destruction. What do children want? They want the easy solution. They want to take the easy way. My goodness, we've got a whole generation now being raised. They want nothing but easy. And we're watching this destruction unfold in society in front of us as a result. And those who enter in by it are many. Is wide there, the poulet. And the many, the polyus, the many, large. So you've got this broad way, the way here. What's going on here? And it goes on to say in Matthew 7, 14, for the gate is narrow. Filippo. Press hard upon. Ooh, remember Balaam's donkey? What's going on? For the way is actually pressing, afflicting. Now, you have, tell me how many children you know will choose an affliction or impression in order to learn and grow. Parents, when you gave your children as that as an option, that this is really going to suck for you right now. And the kids were like, yes, that's what I want, mom, dad, because I know this is good for me. <laughs> is that what you experienced? Narrow in the way. Urisco here, searching to finding a thing sought. Those who come and return to a place to find inquiry, thought, examination, scrutiny, observation, to discover, to understand, to be found, to be seen. This is interesting. To recognize, to show one's own, one's own self. You mean to be pressed so you can see yourself for what you are. To be humbled. The character or state that you're going to be found in as a result. Remember, we talked about position last week. What will actually happen is our position will start to change before him as a result of this being exposed on the way. And those who find it are few. All of us are gathered here on the Sabbath right now. You're not hearing an ear itching message. In fact, I've been saying in the series, don't worry. If you're not offended yet, I'll get to you. Is it possible that we have to grow and mature spiritually in order to not be offended? Because we see that in the physical, don't we? Children are easily offended. Why are we, do we have a whole adult world right now that is offended by everything? Are we seeing adults or are we seeing children? We're not developing and we're seeing it play out on a mass scale. And if we don't develop, we could become into the hands of the adversary because he's not omnipresent. He's not omnipotent. He's not omniscient. How can the enemy achieve what he's achieving on earth? What would be his key tools? We're going to talk about that. The paths of our lives is what I'm going to suggest to you instead of the signs of our lives as we grow and mature, as it would relate to our prayer requests. We have paths presented for us in this time domain, in this test, making wiser faith choices, which we'll get into a bit more next week. But this is interesting. If children are often choosing the easy or the lazy way, well, you're not going to be doing that if you grow and you mature. Is it possible as spiritual maturity occurs in our lives, that we will actually start to choose ways that allow us to know him more, to grow, to allow these things to occur in our lives. And if that, that started to occur on the past of our lives, would it actually dramatically affect our prayer lives? I'm going to suggest to you it does. And I can suggest to you if we spiritually grow and we understand and allow the narrow gate, allow him to do what he's doing in our lives, to allow this crushing, this pressing, that it's actually going to materially affect our prayer life. And if our prayer life starts to become more mature, then his ability to trust us with the choices, the paths, the journey of our lives will start to dramatically change because he's given us this ability to make choices to go down these paths, these journeys of our lives. And when we're always going, well, is this the wrong way or the right way? 
because we're thinking of path as being there's one path. It's God's will, God's will for my life, God's will. And if I don't know it, I'll make it up. What if I suggest to you that your life has many paths and many journeys and that the scripture is actually saying that, but the narrow path and gate upon those journeys is the same. I'm not sure if Balaam could have rode the donkey on different paths on his way to where he was going, but I don't care what path he actually rode with his donkey on, literally, that that would have determined whether Elohim was going to be the adversary or not on that day. Do you see my point? We're always worried about the perfect will of God, according to me, or if I go the wrong way or the right way and all the sorts of things. How about we grow spiritually in whatever way you choose that you know that he is with you? And that the more mature you get, the more you are likely to journey that path in a way that is pleasing to him. Instead of us looking for a sign, should I go to the store today or not? And then we wait for the sign to float past our house. Go to the store. <laughs> what if we could get to a level where Elohim's going, well, go to the store if you want. Just be a good witness and you do. I'm with you. What if we are experiencing all this anxiety, all of this loss of shalom, all of these things, because we're actually sitting on the throne of our lives looking for the little signs as to whether we're actually in the will of Elohim or not, instead of understanding that if we grow spiritually through the narrow gate, that he is going to be walking with us. Is that possible? In the Greek, the paths of our lives, the definition of path in Greek, the hadas here, properly, a way traveled, road, journey, traveling the course of conduct, thinking, feeling, deciding. Okay, not bad. This is what we're seeing when path, generally, this is the word used for path in the Greek in the New Testament or the Brit Hadashah. In the Hebrew, the equivalent of this is generally three used word for the equivalent, although there's more words used in the English translations of paths. But most of the time, as it relates to an actual journey of life, you're going to see three Hebrew words. We've already talked of one with the Delach, the way, the road, distance, journey, manner, direction, habit, of course, life, moral character. The root of this, the darach, to tread, to bend, to lead, to march, march forth, to tread on. Look at this. Tread upon, press. We see the ara, you know, the arach. Way, path, road, the path, the way, passing of life, way of living. Traveler, wayfarer. Hmm. The root of this, the arach, to wander, to journey, keep company with. Ooh, somebody might join, join us on the road. Somebody might join us on the road to Damascus. Somebody might join us on the road to Aramis. What do you mean? We might actually be in these life journeys, these life paths. And, and, and these paths can actually be a part of us determining where we walk when we walk them, even why we're walking them. And so what position do we want to be in when we do this? To journey to wandering the warfare of the traveler. And then, of course, um, the other equivalent of this in the Hebrew is uh, the Naviv. Trodden with the feet, path, pathway, traveler. You remember when Yeshua said, I am the way, the, uh, I am the truth, way and the life? Is that way our thousand different journeys that we will do in the time domain, the past that we may face, all these sorts of things? Parents, think of it this way. Do you really want to be telling your children when they're 20 years old what they must do? Or do you want to equip them to be in the right position when they do it? Think about this. If if you're as an adult going, I don't know what to do, mom, dad, I don't know what to do, I don't know what to do. And you literally say, look, make your choice, son, daughter. 
If you're going to go and do this, a university, you're going to go do this in your job life, or you're going to go and do this on these Saturday, don't keep coming to me. Can you imagine having 40 year old kids that keep phoning you up? Mom, dad, I'm wondering if I should go to the park today or not. It'd drive you nuts. But think of your prayer lives doing this. Your phone call to the father. (laughs) Is it possible that he could be wanting us to grow through the narrow path to a point where we're learning, I will be with you, son, daughter. Make your choice in this time domain, but I will be with you because you're walking at such a point that whether you take that path or this path, I will be with you. And you have given, you've handed over the sovereignty of your life to me to such a degree. And I literally have done this. You ask my wife, I pray it all the time with her when we're facing decisions, key decisions in our lives. Father, and our own sovereignty, in, in our will, together we will pray this. Be the adversary, should this not be the way we should go. I am trusting that he will block that way. If I don't see it, if I don't understand that you, I give him literal permission, be my adversary. Because my adversarial position could actually be telling me to do something I shouldn't. You see, once, I, once we get to a place of trust, I know, just like parents would say, if you saw your kids doing some really bad stuff, it's likely you're going to start to become their adversary. <laughs> because you love them and you're going to start to now step in and go, Hey, listen, stop it. But you weren't telling them what they can and can't do. It's just out of love as a parent, you're going to say, and as they start to trust, they'll know loving parents will become adversaries when they need to be. What they don't want to do is become controlling parents. And the kids can only have to line up every day outside the bedroom and go, what can I do today? Well, that might be required as a five-year-old, but if your teenager is doing that, again, it'll probably start driving you batty. Do you see what the physical is telling us in the weightier matters of the spiritual and the father? Why are we trying to be heard for our many words according to our will? Is it possible he could want us to grow to such a point that we know and trust him and allow him to step in if we don't see it? And could we grow to such a point that his need to play adversary in our life is going to dramatically reduce as we spiritually mature? And that he's with us. Do we not think that he does not want to bless some of the things? He even says, I knew your heart's desire before you brought it to me. I'm the father. I'm watching you. I know what you love. Do you think I'm an Elohim that just wants you to not enjoy anything in life? (laughs) I just don't want you to do this at a place where it misrepresents me and hurts you and hurts others. He's not wanting to take away the various decisions and the joy of our journey in life, even if it is temporary and even if we're fallen. Look at this in Jeremiah 6, 16. This is the warnings to Jerusalem. They're caught in all sorts of shenanigans with their spiritual idolatry and their adulterous behavior. Look what Jeremiah, the great prophet Jeremiah says here in 6, 16. Thus saith Yah, stand by the roads. The roads used there in the Hebrew is the darach. Stand by the roads and look and ask for the ancient paths. Look at what you're doing, you people of Jerusalem. The ancient paths, the the Navi. Turn back to our our ancient past here. You're on your roads and your roads are all leading to a point of destruction. You are not turned back where the good way is. The good way is turning to the ancient past. Man, many of us in our spiritual journeys, we started to discover that, didn't we? We started looking at the front of the book again, didn't we? And we got some crushing in our lives, didn't we? And then we started to look at what righteousness looked like. And then suddenly our prayer lives started changing. He's literally saying to them, stand by your past, but look at what you're doing. Ask for the ancient ways while you're trying to make all these decisions because you're in trouble, big trouble. 
And of course they were. These are the warnings going out to Jerusalem. And find, look at this, rest for your souls. Shalom. But they said, no, we will not walk in it. I do not care what's at the front of this book. I don't care what your ways are. I'm on the throne of my life and my Thelema has made you in my image and I will carry out my will. Wow. And this is happening on both sides of the river. In modern Judaism and Christianity. And look at all the prayers that are going with it. Look at this in the Proverbs captured here. I got the path of mystery Babylon here. Look at these Proverbs. So you will be delivered from the forbidden woman. From the adulteress with her smooth words. Our religious smorgasbords. Who forsakes the companion of her youth and forgets the covenant of her Elohim. Wow. For her house sinks down to death. Sheol and her paths to the departed. The Arach. The journey of their lives, they did not choose. Shuv, they did not turn back to the ancient past as a part of their journeys. So what happens? Her paths to the departed, to those who go to Sheol. They'll go to Sheol sitting on the throne of their lives. Look at this. None who go to her come back, nor do they regain. A path, the path of life. We all are going to experience different paths. But we need the narrow path or the thlebo as we do it. And to give him solemn, a solemn reverence and authority over our lives. And as we do, we will grow. And these paths of our lives will not lead to our spiritual deaths. So you will walk in the way of the good and keep the paths of the righteous. Oh, it is plural. The righteous, their paths of their life journey. There is a righteous position in those choices we make in life. They didn't just look for a sign to go down that way. They're going, I'm going this way and I'm going to do it in line with you, Father, because you are the Elohim of my life. And I know if I go down this path or make this choice as a part of my test, my journey, you are with me. Because my sovereignty has submitted itself and declares it so. And I've given you permission to be my adversary whenever I might make a mistake or get it wrong or go a direction I shouldn't. I trust that you are going to block the way. When I'm truly desiring or looking for direction in something, I will literally pray of my wife, Father, if this is not of you, then shut this door. Block this path. I'm actually requesting that he stop it. I'm not requesting that he make it happen. I've been entrusted with the maturity to make the choice. Do you see the point? I'm growing. He's allowing me to journey my life. And now I will learn to trust that he will block it. Not demand in my prayers, Father, I'm going down this path. Can you please make it all so wonderful? Can you make sure it all goes well with me? Well, Curtis, I'm not sure you should be going down that path. I know, but just please make it well because I want to do it. Mom, Dad, I want to do this. Please make it wonderful for me. Well, I'm not sure you should be doing that, son. Daughter. You see, it's a really interesting thing once we get to maturity. Do you know, I am praying for him to stop things that I desire in my thalema. 
because of the maturity I'm reaching, not because I'm wanting him to shut down my heart's desire or the direction I think I should go or the path I should travel. I'm handing over thy will be done in the sense of Elohim and not me. I'm literally doing this and learning to trust. And this is going to affect our faith as we close out this series. You will block the way. Because I prayed that my will not trump yours. Wow. Are we really praying like this? Or is it Santa Claus God? Are we really praying, Father? Even though I may want this or believe I want this or think I should be doing this. I give you the authority on my life to stand in this path. Wow. Could this start changing how he answers our prayers? Could this start how he walks with us in our journey? If we're actually doing this, is it possible that he can be with us in our heart's desire, but he wants us to be with it with him? And not against his? Is it just possible that he can enjoy the things in the journey of this life? And although it may involve crushing, it may involve pressing. Is it just possible that my life could make choices and every single one of them could be a path of righteousness? Because he's included on the journey. For the upright will inherit, uh, inhabit the land, and those of integrity will remain in it. And I believe that's an incredible statement, actually, to the millennial reign. This journey, this company that we're dealing with. So what was Messiah really trying to teach us? When the disciples asked, how shall we pray, Master? What was he really saying? In Matthew 6, 6, before he answers, it says this, but when you pray, go into your room and shut the door. Go into that private place and pray to your father who is in secret. The Tamah, storage chamber, inner room, the secret room. Wait a minute. Is this standing on the street corners to be seen and heard for their many words? Is this how Messiah actually, he's answering. He's literally asking, how shall we pray then? Think about what they were doing in the synagogues, what, the, what was being witnessed in the religious Sanhedrin system. All being seen, many words, liturgy, everything's going on in full display. And what does he say? No, no, no. Go and be with me and pray to your father who is in secret. The kryptos. Hidden, concealed, hide, conceal, hide, escape, notice. Look at this. And the father who sees in secret. Would you? You mean that if I take away all the see and I'll believe, if I take away all the show, if I take away all the so-called trappings of the religious adulteress, if I actually take this and submit it to him and he knows what I need or desire. And I can keep him in a position of absolute trust on whatever this path is. You mean that it possibly he could actually reward that because essentially I'm not going to be bringing my wish list to him, my Santa Claus list. I'm going to be actually making life decisions and journeys. And I want him here with me. Was it really the reward or the desire that I had was his problem? Or was it the way I was going about it might have been? Is it possible that I had become the adversary of my own desire? I started to learn this in my journey, in my walk. I've gotten to such a point now where, yeah, I desire that, Father, but block it. <laughs> it's not of you <laughs> block that path <laughs> and if he blocks it i praise him for not giving me my heart's desire thank you 
because even the reward would be that at that point, if I grow enough, you spared me from my own stupid self. Anybody ever experienced that? Thank goodness you didn't answer that prayer because I didn't have a clue what I was saying. But what if it wasn't just him intervening like Balaam's donkey? What if it could get to the point where you're presenting it as a part of your prayer request? What then would this start to look like? To reward one's own profit, to pay off what is due. Things promised under oath. Look at this conjural duty. There's even a, a statement here of the reward of actual intimacy, physical intimacy. To render account, to give back, to restore. You mean this could involve restoration of things? The root verb here, the didomi, to give something to someone of one's own accord to his advantage, bestow a gift to grant, to give, to supply, to furnish the necessary things, to cause one to come forth, to, to permit one to go down or to do it, to commission. Matthew 6, 7, 8 goes on to say, and when you pray, do not keep up empty phrases. Stop doing this like children. This is what the Gentiles, those outside the house are doing, for they think they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for the Father knows what you need before you ask him. <laughs> this is Elohim. He's just wanting you to go about this in a way where you will grow and mature and do it in a way that he can work with, that is pleasing. To not keep up empty phrases, the batalago. Look at this. To repeat the same things over and over. Stop the liturgy. Catholics are great at this, aren't they? Oh, yeah. And then they do their things. But so is modern Judaism. To use your many idle words to babble. Whoa. To babble. We talked about that earlier. That reference there of Batas, the king of Serene, who is said to have stuttered. I add that in there because basically he was hard to understand. The root of this is Logos. Now think of where Moshe got to. This pader position, mouth to mouth, of speech uttered by living voice and bodies, conception or idea, the sayings of Elohim. Decree, mandate, order, the moral precepts given by Elohim. What is declared? A thought, a declaration, dictum. It's incredible. Stop telling him how he should do it, what you want done, what needs to happen. Stop it. He is Elohim. He knows your heart's desire. Get it in line. He's not sitting there wanting to be the joy kill of your life. <laughs> He's wanting you to have joy and you're the one hijacking it. Is it possible we could have a father who's desperately wanting to honor our heart's desire, who is wanting to do these things and we never get into a position where he can trust us with it? Is that possible? I honestly have gone to the stage in my life now where I believe that the greatest hijacker of my prayer was not the wily devil. The greatest adversary to my prayer life has been me. Pray like this. Our Father, hallowed be thy name, authority. Part one of what we talked to, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Very clear. The word there, your will, the thalema, your thalema. That authority on my life at all times. Give us our daily bread. 
physically, spiritually. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. As we've gone through both of those in part one of the series. But think about what he's saying now. Establish authority. Make your requests. Establish your position. Repentance. Okay, here we go. Now make your requests. Lead us not into the test and temptation. The parimos. But deliver us from evil. Okay. Stand on the path. Block it. I'm going to learn to trust you. I'll lead me to these places. But if I actually hand my sovereignty over. Is it possible that he could continually deliver us from evil? And if you forgive others, their trespasses, their trespasses against his righteousness, your heavenly father will also forgive you. There's no room for religious self-righteousness here. Man, do I see this all the time. Stop it. We're all going to fall short of the glory of Elohim. All will. And the only righteousness that is allowing us to get through any of this is his righteousness, not ours. But if you do not forgive others, their trespasses, their trespasses, neither will the father forgive your trespasses. Wow. The paraptama in the Greek. The Pesha here is the trespasses, rebellion, revolt, trespassed against Elohim. Do you mean we're actually going to encounter this? That others are going to be trespassing against Elohim and he's saying you're going to need to forgive them too? Wow. I thought that was all about me. It wasn't possibly what was happening to the father. Do you see this? What about where we've trespassed against Elohim? We're wanting him to forgive us. What about our brothers and sisters? Will they forgive us? Will they allow us to get to a place where we get out of that place? And we start to submit again and be in a place of shuv? Or are we just going to crush them, smash them where they are and not leave that to Elohim? No, no, I'll do the job. I'll do it. Because this is a job for the unrighteous judge. Really? I'm seeing so much unrighteous judging going on right now in the body of Messiah. It is staggering. And it is affecting our prayer life beyond comprehension. In my opinion. The literal prayers of the body. Not by my opinion. By the words of our Messiah. The master's prayer. Do not be hypocritical in your prayers. So you can be seen by others for your many words and your repetition. Do it with reverence. His will, not ours. Physical, food, yes, and spiritual. Man cannot live by bread alone. Forgive our debts and forgive others their debts. Don't be a hypocrite. You're falling short of the Torah as well. You're falling short of his righteousness as well. Don't let this hinder your prayers. We really think we can go play Elohim on somebody else on this and then come before the Elohim and think somehow he doesn't see this self-righteous religious silliness. It's not into temptation, the test. So don't let us go down to the very point where now the adversary who's seeking to roam who he can devour is actually going to be required. Remember the position that Job had in all of this and as he was going through his pressing and his crushing beyond levels than any of us would know. He wasn't even on the adversary's radar. He's protected. He has a sook. His sook, your righteousness all around him. He's not even an option. Elohim's going to be considered him. <laughs> the adversaries go, no, of course not. Job had to be offered up to the adversary at that point, as in the adversary, as we think of, Hasatan. 
You mean all this crushing, all this travail, everything else in his life. You mean, and he was considered the most righteous. None of that had anything to do with the devil? No, it didn't have anything to do with Hasatan until Elohim made it so for our benefit to get this. We could walk down a path of our lives, our journeys, be mature enough to choose those paths, have our will aligned with his, and actually walk in a place where we have a sook of protection. And he's actually with us. You mean, parents, you could actually look at your adult children who are making decisions in their lives and actually be pleased and actually be for them? Because you know they're not acting stupid and doing a bunch of things they shouldn't? Deliver us from evil. This forgiveness of missing the mark, forgiving others of missing the mark, moving forward on the path will always require faith. So we must learn and grow and mature in this faith. We'll speak about that more next week. Let's see. The Master's Prayer is summed up with what so far? Authority, position, and request. Know who is the authority. Make sure your position is where it should be. Now make your request known. No problem. I know my requests over the years have changed as I've spiritually grown. I don't think there's a problem as we start to mature with what we face and the decisions that we face in life. And this, of course, we just want it to go our way, take the easy way, have our signs. Where's my green lights in life? Philippians 4, 5, 7 says this, let your reasonableness, your epiphes, okay, say, Greek, for suitable, equitable, fair, mild, gentle, humble. Wow. Be known to everyone. So let this be known to everyone. The root of this. The epe. Upon, on, by, before, of position. On, at, by, over, against. To be like, let your position be known to everyone. The master is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to Elohim. Let your position be in the right place. Now let your requests be known. Be in the place of Shuv. Be in the place of your Thalema being subject to his, coming together and being a God. Now go forth. Don't be surprised that your requests will change as you spiritually mature. They will. But I'll tell you, if your requests that they spiritually mature are not in opposition to his thelema, don't just expect them to be answered. Know that he's with you on it. And the shalom of Elohim, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds, your thelema in Messiah Yeshua. Be made known, the norizo, to make known, to become known, be recognized, to gain the knowledge of, to have knowledge, the root of this, the ganasco. Look at this, to learn how to come to know, feel, to become known, to understand, perceive, to understand. Look at this, sexual intercourse. Now suddenly we find this intimate aspect in this, this journey of a chad. To be acquainted with. You mean we can be in the right position, making our quest known, and then a shalom that surpasses all understanding comes. What? With that request? Because it's not an opposition anymore. It's actually a knowledge, an understanding, an intimacy with him. And all of this is going to bring shalom at the heart and at the mind level. So who really gives power to the adversary in our lives? What am I actually saying here? If the adversary is not omnipresent as Elohim is, this sentient being, Hasatan, if he's not omniscient, if he's not omnipotent, all these qualities and characters of an Elohim, he's a 
sentient being, a powerful one for the role of adversary, but he is not everything and everywhere at once. And he has to operate according to the authority in the kingdom of the office that he's in. So how does he make himself omnipresent? How does Elohim achieve what he's achieving on the earth? Sorry, how does Hasatan achieve what he's achieving on the earth right now as God of this world if he's not actually omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent? How does one being achieve this? I'm going to suggest to you that all of us are the tool of the adversary and what he is carrying out on the earth right now and what he is using as his main tool is our self-worth in almost 8 billion workers of his design for the world. We are the tool of the adversary. If we are not submitted, if our thelema is not in line with Elohim's, then the thelema of our self-will is the actual hammer, screwdriver, whatever tool you want to use in your analogy for the, for the enemy. And you're now seeing it play out on the earth. So whose prayers are really being answered right now? Is the world getting what they're asking for? And as they get it, doesn't look so good. Are we getting what we desire? Are we getting our requests? And who's answering them? We are trying every single thing that is in opposition to the righteousness and the truth of Elohim. And guess what? I can I'm just going to say this. I'm sorry this offends everyone. The world is getting its prayers answered for. Getting their, world, their prayers answered. They're getting what they want. Does it look good? Their prayers are being answered. Because they're praying to self. And the adversary is using that tool to become omnipresent. Through who? Eight billion gods. We're the only way he can be just like the Most High. We're the only way he can even remotely achieve what he's trying to achieve. We're the only way he can be omnipresent. So are we going to remain the main tool of the adversary on earth? So he is with us on the path of our lives? I believe so. The narrow path has not changed, the Thalibo of it. The narrow way is his. But the many paths and choices and the journeys and the walks, the soul journey, the traveling of our lives in the past, could it be that he can actually be with us on the sovereign choices if we can continue to submit our sovereignty? And if so, can we learn to trust him in that place and know that if he needs to be, he'll play adversary? of our life, not thy adversary, the right adversary. Would you rather have Hasatan and you as your adversary? Or would you rather have Messiah? Do you see what I'm about to say? Take your choice because we're in a fallen state. And what I'm saying to you is I honestly believe you're going to have an adversarial position happen in your life according to your thoughts, heart's desire, or wherever you're at with the thalema of your will. But I'm going to suggest to you it is possible that we can actually walk this life out and actually have Messiah as our adversary when we need and not us and Hasatan. Just like Job. Ultimately, like Moshe got to. Ultimately, that Yeshua spent his whole life in and overcame as the sinless lamb. And I believe the early Kahal actually got this in the end. They weren't running around wondering, what's the will of God in my life? What if he doesn't want me to go to the store? They weren't children anymore. I'm going to the store. Messiah's with me. Do you see the difference? We need to grow up. 
and our prayer lives will be directly affected as a result. Could it be directly affected to the level as being entrusted with the authority of the throne? Well, it certainly is in the example of the two witnesses. But I do believe we have a great plan of redemption that shows those who get to that level will be entrusted with the throne, at least in a glorified state for the final age. There's whole example, and we're in this little mini microcosm figuring this out. Is it possible that if we're ruling and reigning with him in the millennial reign, and his righteousness is going forth, and it's going forth through us, mm -hmm. that he's not sitting there going, okay, this is your task today, Curtis. Oh, this is your task today, my Oh, this is what you did. You know, is it possible <coughs> that we're actually being entrusted with something? And that we have him there at all times and that he's king and he's on the throne and his bridal governance is going to do what she needs to do. Or is this him yelling dictates, smashing his rod of authority upon his bride, whipping her, you do what I ask and then go tell those other ones what to do. What do we envision is about to go on here? And would you want to run a marriage like that where you're beating each other? To listen to each other? The greatest place I believe a husband and wife can get to is their thalema has become a chad. They're not in opposition to each other. <laughs> so, let's finish up here. Unlocking your life paths. In Colossians 3, 1, 3, something interesting here, and the word being used here in hidden is crypto. If then you have been raised with Messiah, not self, not Hasatan, seek the things that are above, where Messiah is seated at the right hand of Elohim. Set your minds, your thalema on the things that are above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden, crypto, concealed, escape, notice. Look at this, with Messiah Elohim. So your life is actually hidden. Your paths are actually, and what will happen is an unlocking of this as we set our things on the things above. You mean that we could actually, what, I'm the way, what, I'm the truth, the way, and the life. Do you mean there is a life for us in this fallen state? That actually he can walk with us and that the actual life and the past of what it could look like will be hidden until we get to this place. But if we were in Messiah, this escaping, this hidden, this concealment is going to start to unlock on the past of our lives. But we have to die to our self-will, our thalema, and submit it. And then we will start to actually walk the journey, the traveling of these paths, not looking for green lights. Actually trusting him that if he needs to be our adversary, he will be. It's okay. We're going to walk these paths with him, with our things set above and our thalema in line with his. A prayer of faith. And Yaakov here, or James and your King James Bibles. Therefore, confess your sins. You're missing the mark one to another. Remember this, and this relates. Remember to forgive and not to forgive. The thing that we need to do, us it will hinder our prayers. To one another, look at this, and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Now look at this. Our position in him and the righteousness that he establishes for us the ability to be in that place if we will honestly not pretend to be something that we're not to literally go those prayers have great power while it is working if we grow in messiah it is stunning how this can change and align with the throne and the answer of our prayers become in line with his desire and his will. 
does he actually worry about the path? Oh, I'm going to, should I move? Shouldn't I? Or is he actually going, are you going to move with me? Look at this in the Proverbs. So you will find favor and good success. Look at this. So you will find favor and good success. What? In the sight of Elohim and man. Trust in Yah with all your heart. Do this. He's with you. And do not lean on your own understanding. Allow him to be the adversary when he needs to be. Trust that he will only be that when he needs to be. He's for you, not against you. Look at this. In all your ways, acknowledge him. In all your paths, in what you're doing, acknowledge him. And he will make straight your paths. What do you mean? He's going to make straight your choices? Yes. Stop being a child, wondering and defining and determining if I do this, this, and this, and then this, and this, and this will happen, and all this. Give me a sign. Give me a confirmation. Do this. Do this. Grow up. Make a choice. Go and do it. And what he's saying is do it with him. Acknowledge him as you're doing this, and he will make straight those paths. Trust him, he will do this. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear Yah and turn away from evil. Do it with the tree of life, with the reverence of Yah. The Orach. Go to Yeshua, authority in repentance position, and make your request, your prayers be known. <laughs> I'm going to finish here. Psalm 48. Look at this. Look at King David, the king of Israel. In his place of Shuv, I delight to do your Thalema, your will, O oh my Elohim. I delight in this. I trust it. I know it. I have mine, but I delight to do your will. I hand it over to you. Your law is within my heart. The Ratzon. Pleasure, delight, favor, goodwill, acceptance. Desire, pleasure. The self-will now being his to be pleased with, be favorable. So Elohim's will be favorable, acceptable, determined. To make oneself acceptable or pleasing. I delight to do your will. Let's finish there on this part of the series. If our prayer requests can mature, if our place, our position for, for him is truly in repentance, and we are facing the decisions and the choices of life, is it just possible that he is with us in those decisions and choices and he is for us and that it's our actual position that is causing all of these issues? I think we have a Messiah that is with us and for us and I believe it's exactly what the scripture is saying and I directly believe this all impacts our faith to walk with him and we'll finish off the series with that. I think we're coming to an exciting time and end of the age and we're going to need faith and we're going to face all sorts of decisions. Those decisions and in those choices and in those challenges and in those crushings and all these things are going to come with the end of the age. Is it just possible he is with us and he is for us? I think that the prayers that those disciples asked our master for, how shall we pray, literally unlock it all. Authority, position, requests, and all of it is going to affect and shape our faith. Let's finish there. Let's come back uh, for some, uh, some Q&A here shortly.